the way that government finances are set up, um, you know, we continue to spend more than we bring in in tax revenue, and therefore the debt is growing, and therefore as interest rates go up, the interest costs are growing. And it's, as James Lavish has so well pointed out in all his work, you know, we, we're in a debt debt death doom loop where, you know, higher higher interest rates um, require you know bigger deficits, which means you got to sell more debt. Selling the same amount of more debt into the same amount of demand means higher interest rates and you know, which Ross repeat, right? I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a vicious negative feedback loop. And I think it's getting, we're getting to the point where the can kicking is going to get very, very hard. For centuries, governments have struggled with the challenge of monetary inflation. Even the gold standard, which many viewed as a solution, faltered as the supply of gold expanded slowly at a rate of 1.7% annually, contributing to inflation. However, the advent of Bitcoin has revolutionized the concept of money, offering a potential solution to this age-old problem. Initially met with skepticism, much like the early days of the internet, Bitcoin has gradually gained acceptance as more people understand and use it, transitioning from a niche interest to a mainstream asset. Bitcoin's adoption trajectory mirrors that of cell phones, once bulky and expensive, now ubiquitous. As Bitcoin garners attention from institutional investors and Wall Street, its potential is increasingly recognized. Visionaries such as Fidelity's Abby Johnson have embraced Bitcoin, seeing its capacity to reshape the financial world and generate profits. Bitcoin is poised to overhaul the financial system, offering sound money amidst a broken framework. In a recent interview on the podcast with Sean Clark, Lawrence Larry Lepper discusses the looming financial crisis and the perilous debt cycle facing the U.S. dollar. Larry also explores potential Federal Reserve responses to mounting pressure, highlighting Bitcoin's role in safeguarding our financial future. You know, the, the money is broken, as we were talking about before the show, and it, that's been a long process. It started with the creation of fractional reserve banking, the Federal Reserve. It continued throughout the 20th century and culminated in the gold standard being abandoned by Nixon in 71. And it's just kind of gotten cumulatively worse and worse and worse. And, uh, you know, now I think we're really in the point where it's it's becoming more apparent to everybody and, and events are accelerating. Um, and um, so it's more important than ever to, if you're trying to save money, save it in things that the government can't print. And yeah. that's probably the best choice. And gold and silver are, are not bad choices behind Bitcoin. I think Stein's law applies, which says that, you know, if something cannot go on forever, it'll end. I mean, the math is against them. The they can't grow debt at a, at a rate in, in excess of the rate of growth of GDP without eventually having the interest costs on the debt, you know, create a, a crisis. And um, so, you know, but but you're right. I mean, it, it's it's gone on longer than it should have. And and it could go on for another five or 10 years. Some people think longer. I kind of don't. I think we're going to come to a head here, you know, in the next five or 10 years. But I also thought that, you know, it was going to be conclusive in 2008 and they managed to get can there. Um, you know, they, they've now taken it up to the sovereign currency level. I mean, we had a dot-com bubble, we had a housing bubble, now we've got a sovereign currency bubble. And the way that government finances are set up, um, you know, we continue to spend more than we bring in in tax revenue, and therefore the debt is growing, and therefore as interest rates go up, the interest costs are growing. And it's, as James Lavish has so well pointed out in all of his work, you know, we, we're in a debt, debt death doom loop where, you know, higher, higher interest rates um, require, you know, bigger deficits, which means you got to sell more debt, selling the same amount of more debt into the same amount of demand means higher interest rates and, you know, which Ross repeat, right? I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a vicious negative feedback loop. And I think it's getting, we're getting to the point where the can kicking is going to get very, very hard. I mean, I, you know, right now we're in an interim period where we had a lot of money printed in, in the COVID example. Um, and, you know, they've managed to kind of, slow that down somewhat and tighten up a little bit by reducing the Fed balance sheet from nine to seven, but trillion I'm talking about. But, you know, eventually something else is going to break and the system will not have enough money in it to function. And they'll be faced with a choice that they're always faced with, which is, you know, print money to keep the system going, knowing what the risk of that is inflation, or don't print money and let everything collapse, knowing that that looks something like 1929. And, and we know what they're going to choose because we've seen them choose it for a hundred years. You know, I mean, they chose it in Silicon Valley Bank. They chose it in 2008. They chose it with COVID. Uh, they chose it with LTCM way back in 1998. I mean, I've seen all of these in, in, in my career. And uh, they, just, they just keep choosing the same thing. And, you know, it, it, and the excuse they'll use is the one they used in 08. I mean, Henry Pulse went to Nancy Pelosi, got on his knees and said, look, if you don't give us this $700 billion for TARP, you know, the ATMs aren't going to work tomorrow, <laughs> right? And, yeah. uh, they, you know, they kind of have a gun to your head and they threaten, you know, that 
Armageddon of the financial system unless you print. And uh, guess what? You know, the politicians put into that condition, put in, a, in those circumstances, they will print. So we know they will print. And I think in the next print, you know, the Fed balance sheet goes to 20, 20 trillion. And, and the thing that's important here, Sean, is that it, um, with each of these events, more and more people are coming to see it. You know, I mean, every a lot of people saw it in 71 and they, they, there was a big run in gold then. And, you know, a lot of the hard money people got it, but they managed to contain that by, you know, raising interest rates very high. And they could do that because sovereign debt was a small percentage of total GDP. But, you know, since then, they've, they've you know, let things go in the other direction and it just keeps getting cumulatively bigger. So, you know, to, to timing, you know, I think we're going to see fireworks in the next five years. And I can't, I personally can't see how this system holds together more than 10 years. So, you know, I mean, I think we're on a, a sound money standard or we have hyper Bitcoinization you know, sometime between now and 2034. For 2000 years, we've had the problem of monetary inflation. I mean, the Romans had it and every, you know, every uh, country and government since that time has had the problem, even to a degree when they're on the gold standard, because you know, the supply of gold goes at one, grows at 1.7% a year, which that means you compound that. That means the amount of gold that we hold in, in the world double or yeah, doubles every 40 years. Monetary inflation and monetary debasement is a problem that's existed for thousands and thousands of years. And that's why the invention of Bitcoin is such an amazingly significant technological innovation, you know, because it, it, it takes this couple thousand year old problem I don't know when the internet was introduced I mean, how do people wake up to that i mean there were those of us who were in it early who knew what it was who were excited about it who realized it was going to change the world but you know at, at the time my 70 year old mother at the time was like you know why the hell do i need this and she wasn't going to get a modem and dial up and link into the internet but you know maybe 10 10 years later when all her kids had it we were emailing each other and she wasn't on the email list she said hey set me up on this internet thing i mean it's you know, it, it's just it's word of mouth and it's penetration and knowledge on the part of the of the populace, right? And so, you know, I, I figure there are probably about ten percent of us who kind of get it or are aware of it. Maybe it's even less than that, but let's generously say maybe ten percent of the developed world is kind of in, involved in this whole trade and uh, in this area. Um, and so, you know, we're going to get to ninety percent. And you know, if you use the Gladwell theory of the tipping point, you know, it took us fifteen years to get here. You know, in another 15 years, we'll be at 90 percent. And you know, I saw this with cell phones. I mean, the first cell phones came out. They were clunky. It was 40 cents a minute. You know, only the richest of the rich had them and they, they you know, make five minute calls, but they really needed to make those calls. So they paid for them. Well, now we all have cell phones. Calls are almost free. You know, the monthly charge is, is you know, de minimis for somebody who's doing pre reasonably well. And, um, you know, this is this is how technology works. Right. It, it starts off as being a little clunky and a little misunderstood and. People are resistant to it. You know, I mean, a lot of people are like, you know, it's magic internet money. And you get all the normal pushback. But over time, you know, they come to see that, hey, hang on a second. You know, oh, gee, that thing you bought has gone up a lot. And I think doesn't, you know, this is this is an asset. This is something that if I buy, I can get a good return on it. And you know, we're encountering some of that right now. The, the thing we're having to overcome is that a lot of people are looking at it and say, okay, I get it. I like the thesis. I, you know, you're probably even right. But gosh, how can I pay sixty thousand when you bought it so much cheaper? You know, and yeah. what I'm trying to convince them is that, well, you know, it was like, how could I pay, you know, two thousand or three hundred or five hundred, whatever I started buying it, you know, when Max Kaiser bought it for two, you know, yeah, <laughs> right. And and someday, you know, um, your grandkids will be buying, you know, the price of Bitcoin will be two million, three million dollars a coin, and they'll be saying, hang on, say, you mean to tell me you were buying a whole Bitcoin for sixty thousand dollars in two thousand twenty-four? Oh my God, how did that happen? So, you know, it's just it's kind of a cumulative thing as it as it gets adopted. It arguably brings some negatives because I don't, I don't have a high regard for Wall Street and some of these people. But but in general, it, it also brings a lot of positives. I mean, the ETFs, as an example, as Sailor has pointed out, I mean, this is an enormous positive step. I mean, one of the biggest complaints that I used to hear when I was introducing it to people was, well, yeah, that's, that's too far outside the system. The government's going to shut it down. Well, when the SEC approved it, that kind of put a you know kibosh on that argument. Right. I mean. Um, now, there's not not to say they won't in the future change their mind <laughs> as they realize that it's ruining their system. But but for now, anyway, the ETFs have approved it. And then Wall Street has jumped on board because they can see that, you know, it is an attractive asset. It is going to perform well. They can get a fee on it uh, in terms of, you know, um, managing an ETF. And so Wall Street's all about making money. And uh, they recognize that it could be the future and the more visionary ones. I mean, Fidelity's been at it for quite some time. Abby Johnson got it very early. 
Uh, she was probably the, the leading kind of Wall Street type or investment management type to pick up on it. But, um, you know, like I said, I don't have an enormously high regard for Larry Fink. I, you know, I, I know what he did, what he is and what, where he's been. But, you know, that's fine. If, if he now gets it and understands that what it is and wants to support it, well, that's all good. I mean, uh, my view is anybody anybody who wants to support this this new invention, which I believe is going to change and improve the world, as well as go up a lot in price. But forgetting all of that, I, I really want to see the world get fixed because I, I think the world is terribly broken as a result of, you know, the, the lack of sound money and, the, and living in the fiat system that we live in.